Good evening. My name is Celeste Ryan Blyden, and I serve as your Vice President for Strategic Communication and Public Relations. And I have the happy privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Dr. Barry Clayton Black, he's no stranger to us, but he is the 62nd Chaplain of the United States Senate. He, serves, he has served in that role for 16 years, since 2003. Prior to that, he served in the U.S. Navy for over 27 years, ending his distinguished career as Chief of Navy Chaplains. Chaplain Black is a native of Baltimore and a son of the Columbia Union. He's an alumnus of Oakwood University, Pine Forge Academy, and grew up in Baltimore's Berea Temple. He's an Allegheny Youth member. After his mother accepted the Advent message at an evangelism series. As a Pine Forge student, he was featured in the Columbia Union Visitor, your favorite magazine, for, <laughs> for winning an oratorical contest where the president of the Columbia Union at that time was Elder Neal N.C. Wilson, presented the award. Dr. Black believes in education. He has earned several master's degrees, two doctoral degrees, a host of awards, and has four books to his name. He is married to a local church elder in the Potomac Conference, Brenda Pearsall Black, and they have three adult sons. Barry the second, Brendan, and Bradford, who he loves to talk about when he's, when he's speaking. As chaplain of the United States Senate, Dr. Black pastors the senators and their families, officiating at their weddings, funerals, and all events in between. He leads prayer breakfasts, weekly Bible studies, interdenominational gatherings, and provides spiritual counseling. And each day, he opens the Senate with prayer. Anybody ever see him pray at the Senate? Amen. Recently, our President's Council had the opportunity to visit with him at the US Capitol. And he told us about how he came to know that God wanted him to be a prayer warrior. He said, you know, God told me, and I, I may, may be paraphrasing here, Dr. Black, but he said, God told me I may not be known as, you know, the, the smartest or for my intellect. I may not be known as the handsomest chaplain, but I should be known as an intercessor. And that he has done. We've all watched him pray for major events, like the inaugural luncheons for our U.S. presidents, and just like Daniel in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar, God has placed a prayer warrior, a Seventh-day Adventist prayer warrior in the halls of power. Amen. So since we're focused on the Bible this weekend, right, sola scriptura, I asked Chaplain Black, what's your favorite Bible text? And if you know that you hear him speak, he recites Bible passages throughout his speaking. But he said to me, Hmm, Romans 8.1, if you know it, you can say it with me. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to flesh, but according to the spirit. Dr. Black, we welcome you to the Columbia Union Leadership Summit, Sola Scriptura. We're thankful for the way in which God is using you and blessing you. Your church loves you. We pray for you. And we're thankful that there is a Bible preaching, Seventh-day Adventist, Columbia Union prayer warrior on Capitol Hill. Amen. Welcome. Praise the Lord, everyone. What a blessed privilege it is to be in God's house. For where two or three, Matthew chapter 18, are gathered together in his name, he is there in the midst. So we are in God's house. Uh, Celeste mentioned that I have written four books. Celeste edited my first book, From the Hood to the Hill, so she's a marvelous uh, book editor. And about a month ago, Celeste actually was number five. 
Bible Wisdom for Better Living. So that's available now as well. I love the Word of God. And as Celeste was giving you my background, 27 years here, 15 years here, and that kind of thing, I remember a woman, after hearing uh, my introduction, she approached me after my presentation and said, how old are you, chaplain? <laughs> and I said, madam, I'm a military man. That information is classified. <laughs> uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you after I told you. And she said, don't joke, don't joke, joke, don't just say, I can figure it out myself. She said, tell me a little bit about yourself. I said, I, I was a missionary to South America. She's writing. Said, I pastored 11 churches in North and South Carolina in the Southern Union. She wrote that down. I said, I was a military chaplain for 27 years. She's scribbling, scribbling. And I said, I am entering my 17th year as the chaplain for the United States. Across that, I carry that. Yes, I've got it. You're 89 years old. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I am so happy that you have invited this octogenarian who is approaching decrepitude to share in this wonderful experience. I want to talk about winning with God's word. Winning with God's word. My mother was the daughter of a South Carolina sharecropper. And some of you may not know what sharecropping is. Martin King described it as a new form of slavery covered up with certain niceties of complexity. My mother uh, watched my grandfather, Earl, settling up with the man whose plantation he had worked for a year. And my grandfather, Earl, discovered that he owed the man whose field he was working money instead of receiving any money. And that was when my mother decided, with very little money and only a fourth grade education, to migrate to Baltimore, Maryland. When she was there with very little money, it was very, very difficult. She was on public assistance. We called it welfare in those days. And she, from time to time, worked as a domestic for $6 a day. One day, someone put a handbill uh, for a tent meeting, an evangelistic meeting, in my mother's mailbox. And when I get to heaven, I want to meet that brave soul <laughs> who, who walked into the toxic pathology of the inner city, put that handbill in our mailbox, and then went into run, Forrest, run mode to get out of Dodge. But my mother read that handbill and the title of the message, you know how we do to draw people to our meetings. We have attractive messages. And the title was, The Day Money Will Be Thrown in the Streets of Baltimore, Maryland. And nobody will stop to pick it up, okay? Now, my mom had a fourth grade education because the daughters, if you didn't have a lot of sons, you had to work the field, okay? So you, you didn't see fifth, sixth grade. Subsequently, she went on, graduated from high school and a variety of other things after she got us through church school. But fourth grade education, she said, I'm going to that meeting. I only have two existential questions. She didn't put it quite that way, but that's what she meant. I want to know when the money will be thrown. I want to know where the money will be thrown. As soon as I have that vital information, see ya, don't want to be ya, I'm out of there, okay? 
And she went, Elder W.A. Thompson. Uh, Sister Thompson, we just lost her at 103, and I was able to say a few words at, at her celebration of life ceremony. But Elder W.A. Thompson was the, and, and what a wonderful thing happened to my mother. as She discovered Jesus at that meeting. She discovered the Advent message at that meeting. She discovered the word of God at that meeting. This woman uh, uh, who, if you had asked any social worker, what is the probability of her being extricated from a generational cycle of poverty and pathology? And the response would have been, it's, it's not going to happen. What about her children? She had three stair steps and one in the oven. And so you know how that is. There's a woman with three small children and she looks like she's five or six months pregnant coming to this evangelistic meeting, but she came night after night after night. And when they baptized her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as she was immersed as we say in the watery grave of baptism, she asked for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit on her unborn child. And I was that child in her womb as she was baptized because of the word of God. Now, my mother knew about the pathology and the poverty of our background, and she, she saw that she needed to do something to inoculate her children in that environment. There was prostitution, pimps. You could sit on your front stoop and watch domestic violence. And it wasn't always the man beating the woman. Okay, I mean, this is some serious stuff, okay? You could hear the staccato bark of gunfire during the weekend. So how would she inoculate her children? And so she provided, she was only get, getting $6 a day, but she provided a monetary incentive for us to memorize the word of God. And she promised us five cents, big money in those days, big money, okay? You could get the big Snickers bar for five cents in those days. I'm praying that those days will come back, but I don't know if they will. The big baby roof, you know? We called it the daddy roof for five cents, okay? Um, and so if you would go to my mother's home, you would see the first round. Eventually, I had seven siblings, but this was when I had four. There were five of us. And we would be searching the word of God for short verses, okay? We were looking for low-hanging fruit. And my, when you come to... Our family reunions, we all quote scripture, okay? My siblings and I, we know all of the short verses. My, uh, Celeste asked me what was my favorite scripture, and I gave her Romans 8, 1, but actually my favorite scripture for many years was Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Powerful word, powerful word. Uh, I was also very partial to Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Wonderful, 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 wonderful scriptures like that, you know. Despise not prophesying and quench not the spirit and pray without ceasing. All of the four to three, I, we knew them, okay? When I turned 13, I fell in love with the book of Proverbs. The verses are short. I'd run out of the very short verses, so I had to get the maxims, the Proverbs. And one day I memorized Proverbs 1.10. I was very partial to verses that said, my son, because I had, to put it kindly, a nomadic father. He was not around very often, okay? And Proverbs 1.10 says, my son, if sinners entice thee, my mother insisted on the King James Version. She said, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Okay? <laughs> All right. And you didn't argue with my mama, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Even after I got a doctorate in theology, I did not have the heart to tell her 
um, um, it wasn't around in our Lord's time. But no, 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 no. Just say, praise the Lord. This is his version, okay? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Two young men, I actually Googled the, the, the event. Uh, thank God for cyberspace. You can find out anything to get the specifics and the names and that kind of thing. Two young men invited me to go along with them to get back at someone. And the words of Proverbs 1.10 reverberated in the corridors of my spirit, Al almost audibly. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And in spite of the peer pressure, okay, I said, no, I'm not going with you all. Well, these two young men didn't just get back at someone, they killed someone. And night after night on WBAL-TV Channel 11, WMAR-TV Channel 2, their sad saga was played out. The gentleman who invited me said, I didn't do it. I, I, I did. He did it. It didn't matter. It was the same judicial consequence, life in prison. Now, it is pretty difficult to become the only African-American admiral in the history of the United States Navy Chaplain Corps with murder on your resume. I said difficult because Moses had murder on his resume, and David was not removed from the throne with murder. I'm talking about point-blank range, cold-blooded murder on his resume because he gave the man the note to take to Joab. But difficult. Difficult to become the only Seventh-day Adventist chaplain of the United States Senate, the only African-American chaplain of the United States Senate in the history of the Republic with murder on your resume. I literally owe my life to the word of God. And we need to hear this because we sometimes underestimate the power of evangelism. We underestimate the power of the word of God to change the trajectory of the lives of families and send it in a positive direction. All of a sudden, um, my relatives were asking, well, why don't you all eat meat? You know, because my mama, it, all you had to do was say, is in the Bible or in Ellen White, and, and we were doing it 10 minutes later. Okay, this, this was just it. This is it. Children, you know, new rules. I mean, this was, this was, this was something, okay? Paraline, here we are on public assistance. You got to put those children in church school. Well, all of your children should be taught of the Lord. And each of my mother's children matriculated at Seventh-day Adventist schools from grade one through graduate school. Eight of us, okay? So we not only got the word at home, <laughs> But we got it at school, okay? And, and, and that was real Christian education. Back in the day, you couldn't take a subject. Arithmetic, they had Bible illustrations. Oh, you know, you had to add up. If Gideon had 22,000, I mean, they, they incorporated. This was really Christian education. And as Ellen said, Ellen said, these schools are intended to serve as a barrier against the widespread corruption to promote the physical, mental, spiritual, and social welfare of the youth and to provide prosperity to the nation by furnishing it with people qualified to act with the fear of God, reverential awe as leaders and counselors. I teach senators every week. Been doing it for 16 years, okay? What I teach them goes up to what I learned by the time I graduated from Pine Forge. We, we didn't even get into the Oakwood stuff and the Andrews stuff. To provide prosperity to the nation by furnishing it with people qualified to act with the fear of God. I had a senator tell me after he had been to a briefing 
uh, regarding terrorism and the intent of, of terrorists from rogue nations to eviscerate population centers. And he, can't, and he said, chaps. I don't know why they call me chaps, but they'll, chaps, is God going to per permit people to destroy the world? Here's a man with a Harvard Law degree. I said, Senator, you surprise me. I said, oh, what's up? I said, you're not familiar with the prophecy of Daniel 2? I said, no, I'm not. I said, that's going to be the Bible study this coming Thursday. Bring some friends. They piled in there, leaning forward, you know, like I had classified information, <laughs> okay? I was telling, it was like, I hate to say it, but almost like children's story at church. Okay, John, Jesus loves the little children. You know, uh, leaning forward. And I talked about Nebuchadnezzar and how the boys, I call them the boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Okay, they were wonderful people. Powerful, powerful. Some of you will get that on the way home. But anyway, they were powerful. Okay? And, and here they were. And then Daniel said, why is the king? You know, we, we get all upset about who's in the legislative branch and judicial branch and, 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 and you know, uh, executive branch. But Daniel 1, 1 says, and God gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar was certifiable. He said when they couldn't interpret a dream he had forgotten, he said, kill them all. Kill their families. Make their homes dunghills. And smooth Daniel, who had the word of God inside of him, said, why is the king upset? Hey, give my posse and, and me just a little time, okay, to have a little talk with Yahweh, okay? And we'll get it. And Daniel is now able supernaturally to tell the king what he dreamed. And here's the, the son. Okay, and then what else happened, chaplain? What, 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 come on, can you say? I said, he said, you are the head of gold. Went to the chest of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron mixed with my, hey, they just, what, 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 what? And I said, then that stone comes out of the mountain, smites the image, fills the earth. I said, there's some female senators who come, I said, ladies and gentlemen, before God permits humanity to destroy this earth, he will hang up a sign closing time. Okay. I said, now, make no mistake about it. This earth is going to be destroyed, but not the way you think. For Revelation 21, verse 1 through 5 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. But we'll get to that in the next Bible study. Okay. That's how you do it. They put bait out for my mama and got her, and I've been putting bait out ever since. The power, hallelujah, of the word of God. Now, it is critical for us to understand that we win through God's word because, one, God's word is truth. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Reasoning, apologetics, essentially involves syllogistic reasoning, Aristotelian syllogistic reasoning, major premise, minor premise, conclusion. The premise is the reason. If the reason is false, it can't be a valid argument. And so to try to help you to know truth, the true from the false, you got all of these Latin names for fallacies, argumentum ad hominem, and on and on and on. They've been talking a lot of Latin on Capitol Hill with quid pro quo, but we're not going there. Today. We're, not, we're not going there, okay? You don't need Latin. All you need to know is, does this premise align itself with biblical admonition? Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimonies. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And what happens is you develop the reputation for being far smarter than you are. 
Because you can challenge, just by asking questions, I pulled the Columbo. Uh, uh, just one minute, sir. I just, I, just for, I just forgot, you know. And probe. Because his word is truth. What an edge to have as you navigate through this world and talk to people from different, uh, 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 different experiences. They, I was with a bunch of senators and other folk. Robbie Zacharias was there and Oz Guinness and all of them. And they were on a, we were on a program and they were talking about, um, you know, these are the most challenging times in the history, like the history of the world, but they were saying in the history of the republic, and I was startled by the premise. Anybody who knows anything about history, okay, knows that these are not the most challenging times. And so when I started out, I said, you know, I, I understand your premise, but I said, let me suggest slavery was pretty bad too, okay? <laughs> you, you know, World War II was no picnic. I mean, why are we so hyperbolic? We should be light illuminating the darkness with the truth of God's word. And then we need to win through God's word because God's word is a guide. I don't know what I would do without my breakfast of a psalm. Every, every day I have one of the psalms for breakfast. You got 150 of them. So I get a good nourishing breakfast. You pray one of the Psalms, it's powerful, okay? For lunch, I have one of the Proverbs, 31 chapters in Proverbs, one for each day. So I have a proverb for lunch. Powerful, powerful. Greatest success manual ever written. In the evening for supper, okay, I don't have the Beyond Burger. I have one of the Beyond Gospels, okay? I have either Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And let me tell you something, you get that kind of word in you on a regular basis, it becomes a GPS, a godly positioning system. Now, I'm navigationally challenged, okay? That's a polite way of saying I get lost driving around the block, okay? Everybody knew that, but thank God the GPSs were invented. And for my birthday many years ago, my family, after an intervention, gave me a Garmin GPS. Okay, Dad. It is a, now, if this doesn't work, uh, we may have to talk to the government authorities. Okay, there, here it is. Okay, okay. And suddenly someone who spent his life terrified by the words, and you can't miss it. Okay? Because that I knew I'd miss it. Because you know, and then you do that and turn it in, and you can't miss it. Okay. I became the most confident. In fact, I had a little swagger about myself because when they told me, Celeste gave me a call and I told her I was on my way, put it in my little GPS, <coughs> looking around, enjoying the scenery, you know. Unfamiliar territory, it didn't matter when I needed to hear that voice, hallelujah, okay? The guidance of that GPS, okay? In eight-tenths of a mile, bare left, okay? And even in my sometimes obtuseness, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box, even with a GPS, it says recalibrating, okay? You know, you know please take the first legal U-turn, okay? And sometimes it gets so frustrated with me. Do you know what you're doing? You know, so anyway, but we have that guidance. 119 Psalm 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. And God knows we need that guidance today. I was talking to my Bible studies. I teach four Bible studies a week, and many of you know that we're dealing with the whole uh, impending impeachment crisis. And from the word of God, I talked about Acts 12 and the little house of Mary and some women praying for the impossible that Peter would be delivered from prison. Herod had already killed James. And Peter is chained between soldiers and it looked impossible. And these people were praying with just a little faith because when Peter knocked on the door, 
and the answer for prayer was knocking. They said, girl, you wrote it. Would you please look? We're praying, okay? Peter's at the dump. Would you please? It's not, it's not Peter. Well, what are you praying for? And then I reminded senators and staffers, let us not be intimidated by the demonic. And let me remind you, lawmakers, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6.12, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And let's ask God to do something special. Let's ask God to let his will be done. Let's, God, let's ask God to let the counterintuitive happen. And I've seen time and time on Capitol Hill people who believe the word of God. Trust me, Philippians 4, there are saints in Caesar's household. Okay. And we, we've opened the government up after it's been shut down for a record time. Fasting and praying, sighing and crying for the effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous avail. And his word, his word guides us. But then we win, we win <laughs> with God's word because his word gives us victory over temptation. Wow. I mean, we've got to be honest with us uh, about this. We've got to be honest about it. <laughs> We put up a good front, you know. All right, Chaplain, you're gonna. You know. we, we 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 stand as if we have not sinned. We do not know sin. We are ready for translation. But I want you to know that my autobiography is not a tell-all book, because you can't handle the truth. Okay, <laughs> it's not going. I had to airbrush it six or seven times to clean it up. You know. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. And, but the reality is because I live in the condemnation-free zone, and in Christ Jesus there is now no condemnation. I can stand before you and preach like I was immaculately conceived, you know, because of what Christ did on Calvary. Jesus gave me the victory through the power of his word. When he fought the devil in Matthew 4, it is written, it is written, it is written. In Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It, it's a defense when those thoughts come. And you need to straighten the devil out and correct, bring those thoughts into captivity. But it is also a, a weapon for offense, when you need to take on those who try to gainsay the truth of the word of God. And so the verse that means the most to me when it comes to winning with God's word is in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I love this passage. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, my God, my God. piercing the dividing asunder of bone and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the human heart. You do not so much search the scriptures as the scriptures search you. Like heat-seeking missiles, it finds out the areas of correction that are needed and trains you in righteousness and equips you for teleos, spiritual maturity, so that you can press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So what are you saying, chaplain? I'm saying, remember that the word of God is alive. That's, that, that's what it means by quick. You've heard of the quick and the dead, the alive, the living and the dead. It is alive. I was, when I became a minister, um, President Wigley, I had a, 
I had a, a fear that no one would ever accept Jesus Christ if I made an invitation to discipleship. Who's going to ex- come to Jesus just because I asked him? Just, just terrified of that. I didn't realize that I was dealing with something that was alive. My father was an alcoholic many years, not around very much. And I preached when I came home, made an invitation to discipleship. I was startled when people got up and responded, but even more startled when my father, whom I didn't even know, had come to the service, came in coveralls in the back, didn't even know he was there, got up and accepted Jesus as Lord and the Adventist message because of the power of the living word of God, the transformative power of the word of God. Stop underestimating the power. Use the force, Luke. Use the force. It's a lie. Oh my God, my God. And then it is effective. The word of God is alive. Remember that the word of God is effective. Women would not have the status that they have today. Were it not for the word of God. What happened at Mother Emanuel would not have happened. And I've met with the families of that that horrible tragedy that happened with Dylan Ruth. When they said, we forgive you. My God, my God. Were it not for the power of the word of God. It's effective. I I was trained in Seventh-day Adventist schools. Won the oratorical contest. Blue Mountain Academy twice won the oratorical. 11th and 12th grade. But when I went down to Huntsville, Alabama in the 60s, Brown v. the Board of Education was being implemented with all deliberate speed. (laughs) And there were still colored and white water fountains. But I was so naive, I went down to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God's remnant church, you know, but that my church, this is the church I love, this is the church I grew up in, and I was turned away. And with all of that Christian education and all of that Bible memorization, it was like someone flipped a switch, and I was suddenly agnostic. I went to the dean of students' office you go to the dean of students' office when you did something that qualified you for expulsion. I went to the dean of students' office 11 times after that incident. Barry, what are we going to do with you? Barry, Barry, Barry. And then finally they heard, we're going to let one of your students be a missionary. This is the first time Oakwood University was going to have a missionary. But it is a dangerous mission in the jungles of Peru. There are mountain lions, alligators, the whole nine yards. And the faculty sat down and said, do we have an expendable student? <clears throat> I, I mean, God forbid that anything tragic should happen. But if we, I mean, help, help us, Lord, please, don't. if we just had to lose someone, which student could we afford to lose? And it was unanimous. I became Oakwood University's first student. And it was rough. I woke up one time, and there was a mountain lion. We were, out, we were walking through the jungles to Kampa, Amawaka, Peru Indians. It was an amazing experience. When I came back to school, I'd been transformed by Siegfried Neuendorf, Some of you may know Siegfried. He's still out. He was a minister out in Southern California. Siegfried, a German, blue eyes, was a member of Hitler's youth brigade. And his wonderful wife, Eileen, and they loved me. They, They smothered me. 
with Christian love. I'm coming with the vituperative. I'm quoting Malcolm. And they just ignored me and smothered me with so much love that at the end of my tenure, I said, if this is what Christianity looks like, there must be a God somewhere. Okay. If they could take what I put on them, okay, the word of God is effective. Okay. And then the word of God, you need to remember, it is alive, it is effective, it is penetrating. And in that verse, it talks about suke and pneuma. It separates the physical, the biological, and connects us with the transcendent and has us thinking about the life to come. How would we know why we are here? Where we came from? Where we're going without the word of God? It, it, it gives us a raison d'etre, a reason for being. It penetrates like the parable of the four soils in Matthew chapter 13. And the seed, says the scripture, that's the word of God penetrating and germinating. And who would have ever thought that that woman with three children <laughs> and one in, in her womb, coming to a meeting, would end up with a gospel singer, would, would end up with three Christian educators, would end up with a computer expert, would end up with a gospel singer, and would end up with somebody working on Capitol Hill. Fourth grade education, all because of that 66 book library. That transform. But probably the most amazing thing that the scriptures did for me, it made me fall in love with Jesus Christ. I remember I was 10 years old when I got a nickel for one of my longer verses. First, uh, um, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For we are redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And in my little 10-year-old mind, I was able to deduce that the value of anything should be based upon the price someone is willing to pay. And when it dawned on me that God sent his son for Barry Black, no one could make me feel inferior anymore. I had a, a, something different happen in my heart because that word, <laughs> it penetrates. And I started looking for that man <laughs> in Scripture. John 5, 39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. And I kept finding him wherever I went. <laughs> Even Paul says the rock that the Israelites got water out of, that rock was Christ. In Genesis, I found out he was Shiloh. In Exodus, the I am. In Numbers, the star and scepter. In Deuteronomy, the rock. In Joshua, I found him as captain of the Lord's host. In, in Job, the redeemer, I know that my redeemer lives. In Psalms, the great shepherd. In Proverbs, the beloved. I kept looking for that man, and I heard Isaiah call him wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. In Daniel, I saw he's got to be that fourth man in the fiery furnace. 
Micah called him the one who's going forth of old is from everlasting to everlasting. Zechariah called him the branch. Malachi called him the messenger of the covenant. Matthew called him savior. Mark called him son of man. Luke called him the word made flesh. John, John said uh, he is the monogenes, the only one of its kind for God so loved the world. That he gave the monogenes, his only begotten son. Acts says he's the one who mobilizes us for witness. And you will receive, Acts 1.8, power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Philippians says, at his name, every knee will bow. You can bow now or you can bow later, but every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 1 Thessalonians 4 says he's the one who will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And Jude says he's able to keep you without stumbling or slipping and present you without fault or blemish before the presence of his glory with unspeakable ecstatic delight in triumphant joy and exultation. And John said, I was in the spirit on a Saturday. I, I, I saw him high and lifted up. Uh, he is Alpha. He is Omega. He is beginning. He is ending. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. But the thing that I love so much about him is I started one day praying Luke eleven thirteen. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more is your heavenly father eager to give his Holy Spirit to those who ask? I'm a preacher reading Luke. I said, Wait a minute, Lord. I, I thought that everybody received the Holy Spirit when <laughs> you accepted Jesus as Lord. But you said to those who ask, is there a by request only impartation of your Holy Spirit? Is there another level? So in my little prayer closet, I started praying. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, whatever you're offering, I want it. Abracadabra, however you do it, I want it. Four days into praying Luke eleven thirteen, 13, which I now have prayed daily for over 35 years. Four days into praying Luke eleven thirteen. 13, some strange stuff started happening to me. I was a full manuscript preacher before I started praying Luke eleven thirteen. If I were driving to a meeting and I was 15 miles from home and I realized I'd forgotten my manuscript, I'd turn around and go back to, I can't, I got to go back and get my manuscript. But the Holy Ghost will not let you tether a mind that is fearfully and wonderfully made to a piece of paper. For where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom and there is liberty. And about six days into praying, my wife turned to me one morning and said what she's only said one time in our 46 years of marriage. We were only two years of age when we married. No, not really. Okay. Our 46 years, she said, Whatever has happened to you, I want it to happen to me. I said, well, baby, I said, I just, I came across Luke eleven thirteen. 13. I showed it to her. I just pray that every day. She started praying Luke eleven thirteen 13 every day. And all of a sudden, a big smile came over her. Because what had happened to me had also happened to her. And she is my number one prayer partner. Now, you know, you got a prayer request, you let the black family handle it. Okay, we, 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 you better watch out, devil. Okay, the power, 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Resurrection power lives in you, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. For over 35 years, I prayed Luke eleven thirteen. For over 50 years, every day, including today, I have also prayed James 1, 5. I've prayed those two scriptures for decades now. James 1, 5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him or her ask of God who gives it liberally and won't resent the fact that you're asking. I call it stupid proofing your life. Okay. Okay. God is not going to let you do something long-term stupid on the day you ask him for wisdom. So I ask him every day. When I leave home to go to Capitol Hill, I am armed and dangerous with supernatural wisdom and the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I am so armed, I don't even know how I get through the metal detectors. God, my God. And so this is what I want to challenge you to do as we begin this time together talking about the primacy of the Word of God. I want to challenge you leaders, and I declare it will, it will transform your life. I want to challenge you, and this is not for everybody, for the rest of your life. And I want a preacher makes a request that has for the rest of your life on it. You say, the brother's delusional. And then for the rest of your life, I want you to pray James 1.5 on a daily basis. Ask God for the wisdom that he offers. I am a witness. <laughs> it works. And for the rest of your life, by the grace of God, Pray Luke eleven thirteen, 13, and ask God for the by request only impartation of his Holy Spirit. I do not believe Elisha would have received a double portion of Elijah's spirit without asking for it. James 4, 2 says you have not because, and here is God setting before us a supernatural power and gift. Gifts, wisdom, and the anointing. It's going to be transformative. God does something like text messaging. I call it. It's not an audible voice. Text messaging on my heart. <laughs> I was sitting in a meeting. The Holy Spirit, a little text message, said, I was in Virginia Beach. I want you to go to Washington, D.C. and straighten out your military record. I wasn't thinking about it. I'd been there the previous year and straightened out my record. It was fine. I went to, I said, Lord, my record is fine. I was there last year. You know it's fine. I want you to go to Washington, D.C. and straighten out your record. I said, my <laughs> Help, you need to pray for me. I said my record is fine. And the Holy Spirit says, okay. All right, I'm going. Okay. So, I mean, this is a six-hour drive from where I was. I drive, I pull over to the side of the road because I'm sleepy. Then I drive on in. I go into Arlington, the Navy Annex, where the records are. And as I'm walking toward the door, there's a chaplain standing there. And he says, are you Chaplain Black? I said, yes, I am. And the chaplain said, I'd like to help you do whatever you're here for, okay? This, this chaplain guided me around, and I went into the place where the military records are and discovered that the Navy was going from a paper system to a computerized system, and there were people with piles of paper in their laps. You know? And I'm saying, really? Okay. 
when I looked at my record, if an enemy, I'm talking about what happens when, when you pray these things. If an enemy had wanted to sabotage my record, he or she could not have done a better job. My most important awards, gone, okay? Uh, assignment evaluations, gone. I had an attache case with all of the paperwork in it. We were able to patch up the, the <laughs> all of the holes in my record. And then, the chaplain was just said, um, how is your military photo, chaplain? I said, oh, it's fine. I said, have you ever had the Marines take your photo? I said, no. He says, come on with me. I went to the Marine. Nobody takes photos like the Marines. Okay. Takes them about 40 minutes just to get your pose. And you know, I mean, nobody takes photos. It was the best photo I have ever taken in my military record. And that was the year that I was selected for Admiral. Okay. They looked at 165, I'm talking about the power of God, 165 naval officers, and one is going to be selected for admiral, okay? I was number 164, which meant they would look at 163 other records before they would even get to mine. And trust me, had they gotten to my record, the way it was before the Holy Spirit said, you need to go to D.C. and straighten out your record. He, he's alive. He is operating in this world. Okay. If, if it had been, they, would not, they wouldn't have given it five minutes. Well, we, we know that this one is not even competitive. God has your back. And if for the rest of your life, that's my intention, I don't even feel right if the first thing in the morning, I'm not on my knees. That's my power position. My Savior deserves it. And asking for that supernatural wisdom and asking, Asking for that anointing. For he walks with me. <laughs> and he talks with me. And you know, he never calls me Admiral. He never calls me Doctor. He said, Barry, you get yourself up to D.C. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the joy we share, my God, my God, as we tarry there, None other has ever known. Ellen said not one in ten have an experiential relationship with Jesus Christ. I dare you, I double dare you to start praying James 1.5 and Luke 11.13 every day for the rest of your life. I could tell you 25 stories of God supernaturally intervening in my life since the time I started praying, Luke 11, 13. So I want to pray for those who are willing to make what is really a challenging commitment. But I believe from the perspective of my wife, Brenda, and from my perspective, oh my God, it's worth, it's worth so much. I'm going to ask if you're willing to make a commitment at this, <laughs> this kickoff of this leadership, I want to be armed. I want to be dangerous. I want the anointing. I, I, I want God. Telling me secrets. You remember he said, that, how can we keep this from Abraham, what we're about to do? And then Abraham starts negotiating for Sodom and Gomorrah. Gets down to 10 and said, well, it got to be 10. There's Lot, you know, there's his wife, there's two daughters, you know, that's, 
you know, and then they've got fiance. So if they've been given Bible studies, it's got to be 10. I can stop there. Okay. I want to have a special prayer. So if you're willing to make that commitment with me, would you stand? I'm going to pray for those for the rest of my life. Every day, the Lord gives me the mind. I'm going to be armed, my God, my God, my God. I'm going to be dangerous. I'm going to win with God's word. I'm going to cling to God's promises. 84th Psalm, verse 11, no good thing will he withhold from the upright. Heads bowed, Heavenly Father. Thank you for taking this unworthy vessel and using him to fulfill your purposes on earth. Glory to your name. <laughs> Thank you that our Lord said, it is better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the paraclete, the comforter, cannot come. You are better off with him than having my physical presence. He will lead and guide you to the truth. And so, Father God, as these dear ones stand and make the commitment, I want to get them started in praying Luke eleven thirteen, And so I want each of you standing to repeat these words after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your promise of power. I desire the gift you are offering in Luke eleven thirteen. Fill me with your sweet Holy Spirit and use me for the rest of my life for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, my crucified King, amen and amen. Give God thanksgiving for what he has done in this place. Hallelujah. Now I understand you wanted a Q&A. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask you one. By the way, thank you for the powerful message. And Praise I God. love the promise. Praise if God. your father and mother know how to give gifts, how much more the Holy Spirit God yes. will give it. We just yes. simply ask yes. for it. Thank you. And you're busy, busy, busy schedule. You're always going. How do you make time for time for God in your life? Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was an honor. I spend an hour praying the scriptures a day. Um, the only request that I call it my holy hour, the only request our Lord ever made of his disciples when his soul was exceedingly sorrowful unto death was, can you watch with me one hour? We don't have a problem with an hour of NBA basketball, and when it goes into double overtime, now we don't have an hour when the Washington, we don't have problem when the Washington Nationals are playing, and I'm in the man cave interceding for them. I tell my wife, as long as I'm here and I stay here, they're going to continue to win. Okay. okay. So I give him, let me tell you, praying the scriptures, I, my, my fourth book, Make Your Voice Heard in Heaven, has a, a chapter on praying the scriptures. It will, it will put your prayer life on steroids. Okay? Without an open Bible, I have about a minute and a half worth of good prayer material before I start repeating myself. That's all I got. You know, Lord, thank you for this day. Our Father, which I have never out of the name, bless the senators, bless my children, bless my wife, bless the senators. Oh, I already said that. I'm out, I'm out of material. Okay? <laughs> But when you open up the book and give God the courtesy of starting the conversation, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? Okay, Lord, 
I like that. But if you are indeed my light and my salvation, why am I afraid? I start unpacking that. Now, if you'd walked in before I opened that Bible, and I pray, like I said, a psalm for breakfast, uh, you know, a proverb for lunch, and the gospels for, for, for a meal. If you walked in and said, Barry, write down 50 things that you want to talk to God about, my fear would not be on that list. But the Holy Spirit triggers that heat-seeking missile, that penetrating, and then, yeah, okay, but I am afraid. And I am often intimidated. Why is that if you are Abba? Okay? So you do that, and you won't want to miss it. You know? And I've been doing that now for the 16 years that I've been in the Senate. I haven't missed the Holy Hour. Okay, and I, I do audio uh, Bible. You know, you can get the uh, Christian book distributors out of Peabody, Massachusetts, 1999, and you've got James Earl Jones reading the New Testament. Use the force. Look, no, that's it, and I'm sorry. That's, that's it. I meant, for God so loved the world that he gave me. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. You've got to take time to be holy. And the word of God is transformative. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I want to ask a question that doesn't really speak to the main point of Sola Scriptura, but something that you shared, your experience mm -hmm. of being turned away from a church. Mm -hmm. uh, I had this question for you. What advice would you give to a youth who wants to leave the church because of a bad experience based on you being turned away from uh, church because of racism? The advice I would give is give God a chance to demonstrate his power to you and claim the Bible promise in Romans 8.28 that in everything God is working for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purposes. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would do is challenge that individual to share in the suffering of our Lord. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And to say, you have a, eventually you will have a stronger bond with our Lord. He, he knew what it was like when there was no room for him. Okay, he started out that way. Uh, but even before I made those, made, I would make those two suggestions, I would pray with that individual and I would ask God, I would shoot up a prayer for wisdom again and ask the Holy Spirit to direct me in my response. But those two uh, have been very helpful in situations where people have had challenges like that. Thank okay. you for being on Thank model. you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Emmanuel, uh, yes. Columbia Union. Yes. So how do you make the word of God come alive in a person's life? In other words, how do you make somebody fall in love with the word of God? Um, I tell them, first of all, realize that there is something in the Bible called a table of contents. Okay? So just because you can't find a book, look in the table of contents and you can find the page. Okay? And then with the smartphones, it's absolutely amazing. Second, I would tell uh, him or her, find a translation that really moves you. And I recommend that they go to a Bible bookstore and pick a passage that they like, the 23rd Psalm, and start picking up translations and reading the 23rd Psalm in the different translations. I love the New Living Translation. It's just lyrical for me. But you're going to read a passage, and something inside of you will say, now that's what I'm talking about, okay? That's the Bible that you should um, begin to read. And then the third thing that I would tell them to do is <laughs> to get an audio of Scripture. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. I know that's eisegetical, but anyway, okay. Uh, but um, there's a guy called the voice of the Bible, this Brit, who is just a, an amazing voice. And pray for me, I'm, I'm an Anglophile. I love the, the British accent but it's Scorby, Alexander Scorby. 
I could listen to Alexander Scorby read the phone book, okay? I mean, this, 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 this guy is absolutely, that's right, we don't have phone books anymore. All right, so those would be some suggestions that I would make, and I would do the, I would tell them about the Psalms, Proverbs, wonderful, and start, I'd start them out with Mark, because that's the shortest gospel, although there's some very long chapters in Mark, but, uh, yeah, get them, get them going like that. All right. I I, you know, you're in a nonpartisan position, but you have been able to, um, you know, when you pray, you, know, you, you had some loaded prayers, yeah. you know, prayers yeah. with messages yeah. in them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how does that work and, and what kind of feedback do you, okay. do you get? Well, anybody here been to my office? Let me see your hands. Okay, so a lot of you have been to my office and you know, I've got a view to die for, okay? It's, it, it overlooks the mall, uh, America's front yard, the Washington Monument is straight ahead, the reflecting pool is behind it, the iconic Lincoln Memorial where the I have a dream, it's, it's all before me. If you can't pray <laughs> with <laughs> that view, y you need psychiatric care, okay? So I'm sitting there, I, I write my prayers out of the overflow of my devotional life. So when I am praying the scriptures, I am writing my prayers. I am literally getting the word of God under the radar into the hearts and minds of our lawmakers, the soil of their hearts. They don't even know it's in there, but it's coming in, okay? Um, but this Holy Spirit who's been with me in this special by request only way, text messages, he text messages prayers to me. So during the 2013 government shutdown, I, I, I had written some nice little pablum-like prayers saying, you know, eternal Lord God who alone spreads out the heavens and rules the raging of the sea, bless our lawmakers in this and the Holy Spirit, that's not what I want you to say. Well, this is a pretty good prayer. No, 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 Barry. This is, and you can YouTube the prayers and, and know when I'm going rogue, okay? I want you to tell our lawmakers, have mercy upon us, O God, and save us from the madness. I said, Lord, you don't talk to senators that way. <laughs> I'm not finished, Barry. Deliver us from the hypocrisy of attempting to sound reasonable while being unreasonable. Cover our shame with the robe of your righteousness. Forgive us, reform us, and make us whole. Okay, Lord, okay. So they are literal downloads, you know? They say Mozart, it was like taking dictations for him. It is a, that is, when, you, when, when the Holy Spirit has been living in you that long, He's been in me a long time. That, that power and that anointing. You can feel the power of the Holy Spirit on you. Some of you, I don't know any of you who, who saw the 2017 prayer breakfast speech. Anybody in here saw that? Okay, some of you have seen it. I, I did the keynote address for the 2017 National Day of Prayer okay, with President Trump, Vice President Pence, King Abdullah from Georgia, members of the Ukrainian parliament, members of the Romanian parliament, okay, I'm heads of state from Africa. I get to the podium and the um, teleprompter material for the president is all over the podium. There's nowhere to put anything. And I'm looking out at about 4,000 people. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. And I get a text message while I'm standing there. You can YouTube it and see it. Trust me with this one. Okay. I, I'm tingling from the crown of, I told you I could give you 25 of them. I'm tingling from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I step into a wave of the Holy Spirit. My first words are, President Trump, you want to start a speech and you don't have 
you don't know where you're going with it. President Trump, Vice President Pence, King Abdullah, members of this, okay. And the speech, make your voice heard in heaven. I was literally moving the pieces around as the Holy Spirit was giving them to me. A download, okay. The peroration. I, I've had uh, rhetoricians calling me and saying, talk to me about how you structured that had nothing to do with me, okay, you know. Um, folk were comparing it to Chesterton and, you know, all said that the peroration will be, you know, like the I have a dream peroration, the whole nine yards, okay, all right. That is what God does for you when you, you, you do on a daily basis what you've already done, and that is to say, what you're offering, I want in Luke eleven thirteen, And time and time again, that power, wow, you know, it makes you dependent on him, okay? You receive power, Acts 1, 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, time for one more question. Who will, who will bring up the caboose here? I got to get back to capital. By the way, I, my... I, I, I did an Ancestry.com deal, and I've discovered that I am 85% Ghanaian. So I met one of my Ghanaian brothers here today. So I got to go to the home country now that I know who I am, you know, in terms of my African an ancestry. All right. Good. Okay. Here is the last question. First, I thank you so much for just sharing with us. God bless you. Thank and you. And my the question I want to: What do you find to be your biggest challenge there on the hill? <sighs> my biggest challenge is to maintain ethical congruence. Okay. Um, the higher you go, I tell my wife, with every promotion, I get better looking. Okay. All right, there, 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 there is, people are drawn to power, okay? And people will begin to make overtures, monetary overtures, because they know that you have access. And could you, and chaplain, such and such and such, well, you know, according to the ethics, let me explain it to you another way. I would give you $25,000, you know, okay. So, for you to be inside and in your actions what you profess to be, you know, and not have a freezer filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars as one of the, <laughs> and I mean, this is, they're throwing stuff at you, you know. A, well, we already got the banners out, and what I'll do is send my chartered plane. To the, and you start, you go from hanging out with millionaires to hanging out with billionaires, you know. I didn't even know how many millions were in billions until I said, hey, billionaires, okay? So to be ethically congruent and to have your enemies who do oppo research say about you as they did about Daniel in Daniel 6, verse 5, we can find nothing against this Daniel except it be concerning or connected with his religion. Edgar Guest put it this way, I'd rather see your sermon than hear it any day. I'd rather it should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes are better pupils and more willing than the ears. Fine counsel is confusing, but example always clear. And best of all the teachers are the ones who live their creed for to see good put in action is what? Everybody needs. God bless you and God keep you. Here's my prayer.